At a certain point in history, European countries ruled the world. We can see it here on this map of areas of the world which have at any given time been under European control. The vast majority, if not all, of these times of control took place during the area of colonial empires. Most of the world map is in green, meaning that it was under direct control of Europe. Most of North and South America, Africa, Australia, and Southeast Asia were under these circumstances. Only a few exceptions exist, those which were in a European sphere of influence, maintaining their sovereignty, these were Persia, Afghanistan, Nepal, Bhutan, and Mongolia, and those which were never colonized by Europe, only Liberia, Siam, or Thailand, Korea, and Japan, and those which were under partial European control or influence. According to this map, the only three in that situation were Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and China. In this video, we're going to focus on China and learn how European powers at one point held great power over the country despite never fully colonizing it. We're going to do this by by understanding two things. One, which European countries ruled parts of China and how they managed to do so, and two, which areas they ruled and in what way. Throughout, I'll also choose a couple specific examples to focus on in a little more depth because I think they're very interesting and somewhat representative of the rest and allow us to get a general idea about this. We also need to point out that both the United States and Japan also held colonial control of some Chinese regions in similar or even equal way to the Europeans. I'm going to include these on the list because I don't think it makes much sense to leave them out, even though Japan is a completely different case in some aspects due to its geographical proximity to China, and US examples are very few. The type of colonialism that China saw take place in its territory was called concessions. The concessions had extraterritoriality, meaning they were not subject to local laws or rule, having instead those of its ruling western powers, and were essentially exclaves inside key cities. In addition to those, and in their majority, European colonies in China were effectively treaty ports, precisely the port cities in China that were opened to foreign trade where these western powers could have some type of representation. In this map, we can see them. They are the ones with the yellow boxes around the names. These ports existed both on the ocean coast but also throughout the country's rivers. In red dots are the initial ports of full foreign control, Port Arthur and Talian of the Russians up north, Kiaochao of the Germans, Wei Hai Wai, Kowloon and Hong Kong of the British, sorry for mispronouncing these, Macau of the Portuguese and Quang Chao Wan of the French, although this number grew immensely and had other concessions added to them, as we'll see ahead. The ways in which European powers were able to hold these concessions were two, either through military victory over the Chinese, forcing the concessions through the unequal peace treaties, or through trade deals, which were also somewhat beneficial for the Chinese and which took place with their consent. It all began with the Treaty of Nanking in 1842, a peace treaty which ended the first opium war between the United Kingdom and Qing China. I won't get into the war itself, that's too long of a story, but if you can accurately sum it up, please leave a comment below. After defeating the Chinese, the British forced them to open up their ports to external trade. Up to this point, all foreign trade in China had to go through a single port, Canton, which the Chinese controlled. Although Macau was also kind of open, as we'll see ahead. The Treaty of Nanking was one of the many unequal treaties between the Chinese and Western powers, as well as Japan, which often followed military defeats of the Chinese, forcing them to both open up their economy to foreign trade, but also their territory to foreign control. Although, in some cases, they seem to have done this out of their own will, for economic or diplomatic gain. For instance, much earlier, in 1557, the Chinese leased Macau to Portugal. The Chinese still ruled it, and only in 1887 did it become a de facto colony of the Portuguese, following other ones that had eventually been established as such. The cession of Hong Kong was also agreed upon soon after as a crown colony. But Hong Kong also differed from these trade ports. It was, instead, a leased territory. In these, the foreign powers obtained not only the right to trade, but a truly colonial control over each concession, a de facto, temporary annexation. In addition to Hong Kong, this also happened in Kwantung, today Liaoning, with the Russians and Japanese, in Weihai and Qingdao, with the British and German respectively, and also in Guanzhuan, today Zhangjiang, with the French. In total, there were a lot of concessions, both in leases and through trade ports, to at least 10 countries. These countries were Great Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, Belgium, Austria-Hungary, Italy, Japan, Russia, and the United States. The British were by far those with the most concessions, around 12, then the Japanese with 8. It's important to note these sometimes changed rulers, and so the full number of foreign concessions isn't just an addition of these numbers. France and Russia each had 6, Germany 3, the US had 2, and Portugal, Belgium, and Austria-Hungary each had 1 in total, around 40 sessions overall. I'm basing this count off the Wikipedia article on this subject. If you notice any mistakes, please let me know 
in the comments. This additional map shows us the areas of influence that each of the top five colonial powers in China had. The British area in green along the Yangtze River and around Hong Kong, the French rising up from the colonies of French Indochina, the Japanese in the coastal areas around Taiwan, and the Russians in Manchuria. The Germans also had a lot of influence in the Shandong Peninsula. This was the main area of German influence or control in the country in the Kiachu Bay Territory. In 1860, a Prussian expeditionary fleet arrived in Asia and explored that region around Jiazhou Bay. The following year, the Prussian-Chinese Treaty of Peking was signed. It seems each of these areas of influence corresponds to the major sessions of each of these five countries in China. And the other colonial powers had very minor presences. American concessions were limited to the international settlements in Tianjin and Shanghai. Italy, Belgium, and Austria-Hungary were limited to Tianjin as well, and the Portuguese to Macau. And speaking of Tianjin and Shanghai, there were also areas which these nations ruled together, specifically the Shanghai International Settlement, the Beijing Legation Quarter, the city of Tianjin, and the Gulangyu International Settlement. Let's take a look at these specific areas. The Shanghai International Settlement originated from the merger in the year 1863 of the British and American enclaves in Shanghai, one of the ports the British forced the Chinese to open with the Treaty of Nanking. But unlike Hong Kong or Macau, foreign powers did not hold full sovereignty. They only ruled these specific areas, and so they created a municipal council to serve their interests. The French also had a territory beneath it. Its municipal seal depicts a number of foreign flags, including that of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Portugal, Prussia, and other Western powers. As more foreign powers entered into treaty relations with China, their nationals also became a part of the administration of the settlement. Around 14 countries were involved. The United Kingdom, the United States, Japan, France, Italy, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, Peru, Mexico, and Switzerland. The international settlement came to an abrupt end in December of 1941, when Japanese troops stormed in during World War II. The Gulangyu International Settlement was the only other one with this denomination. After the first, Sino-Japanese War of 1895, Japan came to occupy Taiwan. In order to prevent Japan from further aiming for Xiamen, the area in which Gulangyu was located, the Qing government began to float ideas of seeking international protection and asked European powers to protect the area, which was in part already occupied by the British. This led to the creation of this settlement. In 1902, the consuls of Britain, the United States, Germany, France, and many other countries signed the Gulangyu Delimitation Charter and together ruled the settlement, although also through its municipal council. It also came to an end with World War II, as did in fact most concessions in China, especially the British. In 1943, there was a Sino-British treaty for the relinquishment of extraterritorial rights in China, although it's important to mention that most British land in China at this point was occupied by Japan, so it wasn't that hard for them to give them up. The Beijing Legation Quarter was different. It was the area in Beijing where a number of foreign legations were located. Legations are somewhat similar to embassies, although arguably less important, and this quarter rule was effectively done by the foreign powers stationed there. Up until its creation, China didn't want European diplomatic presence in the imperial capital. However, after their defeat in the Second Opium War, the Convention of Peking required the Qing Dynasty government to permit diplomatic representatives to live in Beijing. And so, starting with the UK, France, and Russia, a total of 11 countries established themselves in the area. In around 1900, the Boxer Rebellion took place in China, an anti-colonial movement and the legation quarter was besieged by boxers and the Qing army for 55 days. The siege was lifted by a multinational army, the Eighth Nation Alliance, which marched to Beijing from the coast and defeated the Chinese army in a series of battles. Beijing was then occupied for more than one year by the foreign armies and foreign influence grew even more in the following years. And finally, the other settlement that was ruled by many powers, Tianjin, opposed to Gulangyu or Shanghai, which were ruled indirectly through their municipal councils, or Beijing, which only saw Western powers control a quarter of the city together, Tianjin effectively had territorial concessions for each of the present European powers. We can see it on this map of the city. France, Great Britain, Germany, Japan, Belgium, Russia, Italy, and Austria-Hungary each had a part of the territory under their control. The ways in which each country attained their concession was different. For instance, Austria-Hungary's was through its participation in that eight-nation alliance that took down the Boxer Rebellion, which we mentioned earlier. They sent four cruisers and 296 soldiers, and as compensation gained this concession. The same happened with Belgium. Just like with Belgium or Austria-Hungary, Italy's Tianjin concession was the only one in the country, but it was granted by the Chinese government directly. The Americans didn't have an 
official concession and theirs was apparently incorporated with British one, but it de facto existed. Germany's concession was lost after World War I began, China quickly took it over themselves, and the rest of the German concessions throughout China were also lost when the war ended, with them being given to Japan by the Entente without the permission of the Chinese. Those were the four internationally ruled settlements in China, effectively colonies with shared custody, if you will. Other notable sessions were, for instance, Macau, which I mentioned earlier, arguably the first European colonial presence in China, being under some type of Portuguese control since 1557 all the way to 1999, both the first and last European holding in China. When they first arrived, they attempted to take land by force, but were defeated by the Ming Dynasty armies. However, later on, they actually allied with the Ming to help them defeat local pirates. After this, they were allowed to settle in Macau and establish trade from there. The Kingdom of Portugal declared a right of sovereignty over Macau in 1783 and included it as part of their territory in its 1822 constitution. In 1887, China recognized Portugal's perpetual right to own and rule Macau, as long as they did not give it to a third party like the Entente eventually did with German possessions. Eventually, Portugal itself offered to retreat from Macau and return it to China. Although the area, like many other former concessions, is still full of European culture and influence. There were also a few additional planned concessions that were planned but never happened due to various reasons. The British would have gotten five more, Japan four, France two, and the US one. So, those were the European and also Japanese and US concessions in China. There are so many of them that I can't really get into all of them in detail, but I think through this we were able to understand how they began, both with the commercial interest of China, of which Macau is initially an example, but mostly through the unequal treaties forced upon them by European powers that defeated them in battle, beginning with the British in the First Opium War, forcing them to open up their trade to the West with the establishment of trade ports and also opening the door to full-on sessions, either through leases or concession agreements, which established de facto colonies such as Hong Kong. If you want a more in-depth video about European presence in China, please let me know in the comments. Also leave a comment with your opinions about this, any corrections you might have, or any additional information we can all learn from. Subscribe if you want, and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.